Good morning. I'm Lance French. I'm the Director of Marketing for WM Environmental. I'd like to welcome you to our webinar on Hurricane Harvey Health and Safety Hazards. Our panel expert today is WM's Lori Siegelman. Welcome, Lori. Good morning. Hi. Thank, Thank you, you for joining us today. Um, before we get started, I wanted to take uh, go over a few housekeeping items. If you have any questions, please send them to me through the chat tab on your GoToWebinar window. If we don't get to your question, I will make sure Lori sees it and we will get an answer to you as soon as possible. We are recording this webinar and it will be available to rewatch later this afternoon. I will send you an email with the link so you can, uh, when that's made available, we also will include the slides. So that's enough out of me, Lori, let's get to it. Okay, thank you. Um, we have individuals here at WM um, that, of course, we have an office in Houston, in San Antonio, and Corpus Christi. Um, and so, our folks, in addition to from a from a professional standpoint, helping our clients with um, potential response and getting back online after hurricanes or flooding damage at their facilities. Um, because we have offices located in South Texas, some of our employees were affected and their friends and families as well. So I was asked to um, put, it, put together a presentation for our internal use so our employees would have some health and safety awareness as they dealt with the aftermath of, uh, of what happened down in South Texas. And then um, everyone thought it would be the, a good idea to offer it externally to our clients and others uh, that follow our um, follow us. <clears throat> so with that, I will let you know that um, most, if not all, of the presentation material was adapted from training presentations developed by the National Institute of, Her of Environmental Health Sciences, their worker education and training programs. Um, I looked at quite a few references and all of the different um, uh, links and websites that you go to when you go, say, for instance, to OSHA.gov or to the FEMA website. And I found that this particular, uh, this particular institute had much better information than the rest. It has a wealth of information. You could spend all day reading about hurricanes and hurricane response and other safety and health topics. Um, the second link listed on this slide, the tools link there, is the National Clearinghouse for Worker Safety and Health. Um, and so it has a lot of tools and it has other tra training presentations you might be interested in. So with that, we'll get started just knowing that a lot of this is adapted from uh, presentations that were on that website. I just picked and um, picked around different presentations to put together what we needed uh, for WM. So it might not be exactly what you need, but at least it will give you a little bit of an awareness. Uh, but the objectives of the program or the presentation really is to identify the hazards when you're out in the field doing any kind of survey or response, um, explain how to protect yourself from these hazards, and then increase your awareness um, uh, so you can better protect yourself. The physical injury was the leading diagnosis or the le leading cause of injuries and illnesses after Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Andrews. So um, check with your local medical provider if you're sending people out in the field or, for instance, you have family and, and friends or yourself uh, are down in Houston dealing with this or Corpus or wherever you are at, um, check the local medical provider and you know, know ahead of time if you have an incident and you need a medical help where the nearest location is. And some key items to have with you would be insect repellent, uh, a water life vest maybe if you're over, over water, earplugs because there might be um, equipment in the area, uh, large trucks, uh, chisels, things like that. Bottled water, also good to have. Don't count on uh, being able to find water when you're out there. Sunscreen especially, and maybe rain gear if rain is in the forecast. So some of the injuries that you might uh, stay away from or be aware of that might happen and try and protect yourself and stay alert would be vehicle accidents, uh, struck by accidents, falls, contusions, and lacerations. And again, this is all from data compiled after some big um, historical uh, natural disasters like Hurricane Katrina. 
Lori, so on on an injury, so I would imagine that it would be really important not to t- take it in, it, whatever injury it would be very seriously, even if it's a cut, you know, a bruise or whatever. I would think that this would be even more like if you got cut at your house, just in your garage, you was like, oh, I got scratch. In this case, is it more important to make sure that you take it seriously or? Yes, more important just because of the of the of the area being potentially or areas if it's been flooded, you don't know what was in that flood water um, or the area. You have much more um, risk of tetanus or infection, so you need to wash wash the cut or scrape or yeah, whatever just, it is don't immediately. Just say, oh. Don't just dismiss it. Wash it with soap and water immediately. I think we have some on okay. that later in the slides, and then um, definitely. Uh, don't don't not get medical attention if you think it deserves medical medical attention certainly certainly do that okay. um, so driving around uh, after in the aftermath uh, might be a little more hazardous than normal driving um, you should try to avoid washout sections of road there should there is most likely going to be debris and potholes um, drive defensively as you always should, and be prepared for delays. Know that uh, maybe your normal route or a normal route to get somewhere may be blocked. There may be a, a lot of traffic, so give yourself plenty of time to get where you're going to get. Watch for construction vehicles, flaggers, overloaded vehicles, um, worker transportation to the to the work site to um, just. Pay attention to all those things and know that you're gonna you're gonna be not in normal traffic situation. There could also be other traffic issues such as uh, traffic signals that aren't operating properly, landmarks and street signs that may have been there before are not there anymore, um, puddles or high water that still may be left in low lying areas. Um, may cause hydroplaning or loss of control. So again, just be prepared for delays. Be very, very defensive in your driving and watching for other drivers and flaggers and construction going on around construction, work site vehicles and things like that. Um, one of the bigger, uh, more risky hazards would be electrical and overhead power lines and downed electrical wires and cables. So treat all power lines and cables as energized until you know for a fact that they are not. Um, Workers most at risk are those that are removing debris from roadsides and in the process of pruning trees, uh, maybe removing downed trees. Verify that a line is not energized. uh, Ensure your safety. So lines on both the load and the supply side of the work area must be grounded. Um, okay. okay. Exposed underground power lines might might be present as well. So you had a lot of flooding or the hurricane, um, the, the ground might have been disturbed somehow and now you have exposed underground power lines. So uh, be aware of that. Uh, water pipes, faucets, sinks, and tubs uh, should be free of leaks. So if you're going into your, your home or you're going into uh, a, a workplace or commercial retail uh, where you're doing a, an inspection or a survey, look for the water pipes, faucets, sinks, and tubs. They, they should not be leaking. Um, don't use that water for drinking or cooking or washing food until you know that that water has been cleared and deemed safe. That's why you should take water with you to the work site. Don't, don't depend on the water at the location um, for drinking water. Um, wear your personal protective equipment, hard hats, safety shoes, eyeglasses, work gloves. Um, I, know, I know from people I've talked to who are doing cleanup down there that these items are in short supply. Um, you can't just run down to your local Walmart or safety supply store and pick up dust masks and, and gloves, perhaps. So that is the one of your best uh, best things that you can do to protect yourself from these common injuries that they see during disaster recovery. Um, so wear it, uh, immediately clean out all open wounds con- cuts like we were talking about before with clean water and soap. 
Uh, so again, a reason to take water with you, not only drinking water, but take some first aid supplies, including some uh, the ability to wash if you were to get scraped or cut uh, while you're out in the field. So you want that soap and clean water. And antibiotic, clean, antibiotic ointment to discourage infection. So you have that with you. And then the medical um, to see a doctor or get, get medical attention. Um, tetanus shot. Uh, tetanus booster. Make sure if you are yourself doing some cleanup work um, or if you're with a company who's doing disaster recovery or cleanup or remediation or even just as simple as site survey um, visual assessments, um, be sure that you're up on your tetanus shot. If a wound gets red, swells, or oozes, um, immediate medical attention would be necessary. And I saw on a list that our church, we had some volunteers going down there um, on that list. They were saying to work, get gloves with that are soaked in nitrile. Is that right? Nitrile gloves. Nitrile gloves. And so what's the importance of nitrile gloves rather than just your normal work gloves? Well, a, a nitrile glove um, would be some chemical. It gives you some... Um, protection against chemical absorption. So a regular leather glove, a leather work glove is going to protect you from the more physical hazards, the sharp edges, um, and from getting cut and abraded from, from your skin. But it wouldn't protect you, say, if you're reaching into some something wet or that has some chemical contamination like oil or fuel or whatever chemical that it's going to soak through the leather and then get on your skin. Okay. So the nitrile inner glove would be good. Okay. To have. Good. So this is an example of an un unstable structures that workers uh, may be tempted to enter. Um, oh, Sorry, you, you guys aren't looking at the picture yet. Um, this is just more about uh, things to do in advance. Make sure you have your personal protective equipment, which we already talked about. Um, immediately clean out your wounds. And then the next picture is the unstable um, structure that you might be tempted to go in. So structural integrity. If you're going out doing disaster recovery or just touring an area or doing an assessment, be absolutely sure that the structure you're going to enter is stable. Um, it, it may be unstable and not immediately evident. So don't enter it um, if there's any kind of indication that the walls, if the walls have large cracks, if it looks like it's shifted a little bit off of its foundation. Um, just be absolutely sure that it's stable and clear before you enter. If, if there's any... Um, Anything that makes you feel like it might be not safe, any doubts at all, there's licensed professional building inspect inspectors should be consulted. Now, of course, if you've got thousands of people that want to go back in their homes, not every one of them can stand outside and wait for the building inspector. Understand that. But um, this presentation really was geared toward health and safety for our workers who are responding in a professional manner to commercial clients that have potential damage and want us to do some inspections or surveys or assessments. So, so for a company and a worker, um, you know, for our worker safety protection, we won't, we don't want our employees and you wouldn't want your employees to go into a building unless it's been uh, designated as safe. So there, there could be severe damage to the structure. Obviously this picture, uh, you know, this, this looks unstable, and it's definitely had some structural damage. Um, other types of structural damage um, that you might look for, distortion of the structure, roofs that are sagging, walls that are not vertical or straight, a shift in the building where maybe it doesn't quite meet the foundation, crack, cracks in the masonry, things like that. Just look for that, and if it's deemed unsafe, don't, don't wander through it. Uh, this is an example of uh, if a building has been inspected and it's deemed unsafe or it has some restricted use. If you see something like this, a sign, you know you don't you don't want to go in. Uh, health hazards to be aware of. Um, I, I know you probably all know already from the news reports and um, other 
other experience that when you have the flood and hurricane situation, you might have some chemical chemicals and oil in in the water. And then when the water recedes, you've got that chemical residue left behind. So be aware of that. Uh, some other heat-related illness, um, especially this time of year when it's still very warm outside, be very aware of heat stress. Um, here on this slide shows the different symptoms of the three different types of, of heat-related illness, uh, first starting with heat stress, then it, it progresses to heat exhaustion, and finally heat stroke. So something to not play around with and, and very, very common with people who might be out there trying to get things done. Um, but but take, take precautions, um, frequent work breaks, drink lots of water, about one cup every 15 minutes, wear lightweight, light-colored, loose-fitting loose clothing, um, avoid caffeinated drinks or heavy meals, and if you have any of these symptoms at all, get metal, medical help immediately. And hydration is critical, so I, I can't stress this enough. I know it's been in several of these slides to drink plenty of fluids. Sunburn is another thing to watch out for, um, overexposure to the skin, sunglasses if you're going to be outdoors, sunscreen, lip balm, protective eyewear, so if you're working outdoors a lot, maybe safety glasses that are tinted. Noise, uh, I mentioned at the very beginning that one of the things you should have in your pack that your, or your supplies that if you go out are earplugs. So you might may not need these necessarily, but if you're going to be working next door to where they're chopping down trees or using earth moving equipment or pneumatic tools, then you'll be glad that you had those. So it's uh, good to have that with you. Carbon monoxide inhalation, so if you're in an area where the power is out, for instance, and there's a lot of generators being used, something to be very uh, aware of is the, the risk of carbon, carbon monoxide because it doesn't have any warning properties. It's colorless, odorless gas. Um, areas that might be affected near operating equipment, near generators, if there's fire pits, for some reason maybe they're burning debris. Um, burning and compacting. So be aware of the carbon monoxide issue as well. Um, hazardous chemicals again. Uh, we had this slide before. Um, here's another slide of this. And, and on this slide, I just put a little quote from one of the newspapers that it's a little inflammatory about the stew of toxic chemicals. Um, but it is very important to be aware of. So if you've had floodwaters, you don't know what was in that in that water. Certainly if the water is still there, um, you want to be very careful. And if it is an area that had been flooded and isn't, isn't anymore, still you might have some residue and debris left behind that could be contaminated or most likely is contaminated uh, at a minimum with um, bacteria and, and things like that. Um, potential chemical exposure uh, would be the jobs affected by this particular risk or hazard would be more the people who are removing the debris and doing site cleanup. Um, but symptoms of kind of from an, from an overall general standpoint, typical symptoms of chemical exposure are irritation, respiratory irritation, eye, nose, throat, skin irritation if you've got some, some things that get on your skin. Um, if you've got more of a, a, a higher dose, so to speak, or a lot of chemical in the air that you're breathing, um, or you've ingested some uh, more symptoms like central nervous system depression, fatigue, sleep, sleeplessness, and confusion. So keep in mind, if you start feeling some of these issues, you might have come across a chemical exposure. Hazard communication, um, if you are a workplace like WNM and you have employees that are doing something work-related that has to do with debris cleanup or um, site inspections, hazard communication, um, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, HASCOM standard, does apply. Um, so each worker or workplace would be, would be required to communicate the potential hazards and risks to their employees before they go out. Um, another 
another risk to be aware of is the waterborne disease. Uh, kind of goes without saying, again, if you've had floods, um, that that water might have had and most likely did have some amount of sewage in it, um, so that can make you sick. Um, you want to wash your hands often with soap and clean water and use water-free sanitizers. So uh, more things to take with you as you're going out to have that stuff with you. Again, just the flood waters are bad. So um, some terminology here, uh, black water versus gray water versus clean water. Um, Raw sewage is commonly referred to black water. You might you might hear that term if you're doing some cleanup. Uh, if if you have an area that's been flooded and it's been flooded with black water, pretty much the protocol is all of that goes. You can't you don't want to dry it out and reuse it unless it's hard hard surface non-porous like um, that door. Maybe you could clean the door. But anything that's porous, all that just should go out, go out the door. Um, the second term, gray water. Gray water is more like your shower water, your sink, your dishwasher, things that don't have sewage in it but have been used. And then, of course, clean water would just be like if you had potable water source, um, a, a water tank, for instance, that burst and um, flooded your garage then that would be clean water. You can just dry out things and you're okay. But if you've got black water, certainly that's bad, bad thing. Um, and then gray water is kind of in between. Um, but those terms come into play when you're trying to decide what to do with the items that have been affected by that water if it flooded. Animals and insects. I think there's probably not many people that, who haven't seen the pictures of the floating balls of ants. Um, or the alligators in the, uh, in the backyard and things. So um, protect yourself and mosquitoes. If the mosquitoes aren't aren't already bad, I'm sure they will get they will get bad. Um, protect yourself from mosquitoes. Do use uh, mosquito repellent. Wear long pants, socks, long sleeve shirts. Um, beware of wild and stray animals. Um, and then fire ants and spiders. I, I think I read that they asked a an ex a fire ant expert what how to handle, and the response was avoid them. So I'm not sure you have to I be an expert to to figure out you don't want to get involved with the fire ants. Um, snakes, alligators uh, can be hiding in unusual places. Um, so if you will be walking around kind of in debris-laden areas, um, then certainly snake chaps or snake guards might be a good thing to think about. Um, and obviously, if you get snake bitten, you want to seek immediate medical attention. Um, poisonous plants, uh, too, I, th I think this is more Common. I'm not sure if it's only because of it's. There's been a flood and a hurricane is going to immediately cause more poison ivy. But you might be walking around in areas that have these poisonous plants that you wouldn't normally have been in before. So just uh, be sure that you know how to recognize poison ivy and poison oak. I um, mean, it could be growing. It could be look like a bush. It could look like a vine growing up on trees and fences, um, even at the beach. So even clothes, shoes, and tools that become contaminated, and then if you come in contact with that, like I have a dog that goes and roams in the poison ivy patch while I'm not home, and then I go and pick the dog up when I get home, and then I got poison ivy all over my hands or my mm. arms. So bad, yes. bad situation. So for those of you that need just a reminder, the far left picture is poison ivy. Um, the middle picture is poison oak, and the picture on the far right is poison sumac. Um, so one of the things somebody recently told me, because poison ivy doesn't always look like that left picture, and that's usually what you think of when you think poison ivy, but if you, somebody recently to told me a way you can recognize it if it has those thumbs, if you turn your hands kind of outward, the bottom two leaves have those little protruding 
protruding areas on its leaves. They look a little bit like thumbs, and then the middle leaf has a thumb on each side. So that's helped me when I see a, a poison ivy in a, in a form that's not normal or usual. Um, and then I can just look for that, and it keys me into, yeah, that is poison ivy. So that right there is pretty interesting. Yeah, it, yeah. It's pretty cool. It's good. Um, asbestos, also with structural damage, um, you have a lot of the older homes, maybe um, older buildings that might have asbestos now that were, was sealed and encapsulated and not an issue before, now becomes an issue. So homes that were built or renovated before 1970 may contain asbestos. Um, insulation, it's commonly found in insulation for pipes and furnaces and boilers and things. So the next picture is a, there's some photos that you could be, um, what they might look like, a mud joint, air cell insulation, around pipes and boilers, any kind of insulation like that. And then now we get to, to the mold. Um, I know this is going to be or is already the most common issue um, that's being dealt with. So you have the water that creates the perfect environment for mold growth. Um, severe mold uh, exposures, you recommend Tyvek. So if you're going into a building and you're doing some kind of response, or maybe you're just doing an evaluation and an assessment and there's a lot of mold, you can see on this slide, um, can happen very, very quickly. Um, then maybe a Tyvek suit so it doesn't get on your skin, you don't get it on your clothing and take it home to other people uh, in your household or your workers. Avoid breathing to dust um, generated by the wet building material. So you have fungal spores, um, so that would require a respirator, disposable respirator. An N95 NIOSH approved respirator would be the best thing. Um, Wearing long, again, long sleeves, gloves, long pants, so you don't want a lot of skin contact. You don't want to disturb the material so it gets airborne either. So, Lori, if we walked into a house and we saw that on a wall, that would be pretty obvious there's a mold issue. But what can the non-expert, because I'm sure there's instances where you're going to you have mold, but it may not be as bad as this. So how do you, is there any signs that you can say, hey, there might be a, there could be a mold problem or is it you just have to, you don't know and you just have to wait till it gets that bad? Well, if you've got, you'll know if you have water damage because sure. immediately there's going to be, you know, you know, I mean, it, you're flooded or you're not, or you see there's a water staining on your wall. And so anytime you have moisture, say you've got water damage, you had water stamp, water staining and now it's dry or you think it's dry if you can dry it out quickly then you can you can avoid getting the mold but um, if it doesn't get dry quickly then the mold bloom will happen I I think it happens fast enough where you're not gonna have that gray area in between so if you've had water damage you know you had water damage and you're not seeing visibly anything that looks like mold growth like on the picture, but you still think, well, maybe it's on the inside of the wall, maybe it's hidden, and we'll see some more pictures in a minute too. Maybe it's hidden and you don't know. You could take an air sample, but really from what I read, the historical um, kind of work they did after Hurricane Katrina and some of the other disasters is that the mold ambient mold spore count just because of everything is a little higher anyway. And so I don't know that air sampling would really do you any good. You, you're going to know, I think visibly you're going to be able to see it. Cause it, it's that quick. It's you, that fast. It's that fast. Okay. Yeah. So some things to, to be aware of again, especially if you're a worker that's going to be responding to, um, mold situations, um, if, if you've got pre-existing medical conditions, um, that may need to exclude you from doing any mold cleanup work or assessments in an area that has heavy mold contamination. So be sure and check with your doctor. Heart and lung disease, uh, if, if you're a person with a heart disease, a lung disease, asthma, allergies, immune system disorder, or pregnant, then you want to um, may be excluded from doing this type of work. Um, mold is a type of fungus. 
if they form spores, the spores are released into the air. Um, and then, then when they get onto the surface that's wet, they start to grow and proliferate. Um, they're naturally occurring in the environment. Mold is really everywhere. There's over 100,000 species of mold, some of which causes negative health effects in people. Not all mold does. Um, as I said before, Lance, when, when you asked, it's really influenced by moisture. So if you, if you have something that's been wet and it, it's completely dry, the best thing you can do is dry everything as quickly as you can. Um, assuming we're talking clean water, not gray water or, white, or, or, or black water, um, then you've got other issues. But the moisture, if you take away the moisture, then you would be good. Mold really needs uh, a food source like a drywall material to, to, to grow. Oxygen, temperature, high humidity, um, warmth, uh, moisture, all of that it needs. So there's some pictures, just there's a mold. If, for, for those of you who might not be familiar with what it looks like, it can take many different forms and yeah, it can be quite colorful. You've got white mold, there's some gray, fuzzy stuff there. Um, exposure primarily is caused by inhal inhaling the mold spores that become suspended in the air. But other exposures, skin contact and ingestion, uh, are an exposure as well. The symptoms mainly is going to be irritation of the eye, nose, and throat. Mold-sensitive people uh, might even cause uh, shortness of breath and asthma flare-ups. And I think this, this is one of that misplaced slides. Oh, so let's go on. Um, when you are going to enter a home that's been damaged or you're doing some assessment, say it's been closed up for a while and now you're just going back in um, and, and you've got some mold issues going on or you might have some mold issues and, but you don't know because you haven't been in there, open the doors and windows, um, let it air out for at least about 30 minutes before going in. That'll get the air flow going so the, the concentration of mold spores that are there, if any, will be lessened. So before you go in, at least 30 minutes, open all the doors and windows. And then basic precautions to take when you are doing cleanup or doing an assessment or evaluation. Don't smoke or eat at the work site inside the building. Don't rub your eyes. Try to, try to keep that hand-to-face, hand-to-mouth contact to a minimum. Um, protect yourself from the sun and the heat. Again, water, sunscreen, and take frequent breaks. Lots of water. Water, water. Um, and here we are mold again. These, these slides, uh, I think, are a little mixed up. Um, here's more pictures of mold. It could be hidden. So there's a picture of like a, a under, under a wallboard or a piece of wood on the back side where you have just little dots. Uh, black dots look a little different than the picture we saw earlier. And then, oh, here's the back of the drywall. And some wood plywood. Um, and I talked about keeping things dry or making sure things are dry, get dried out, dried out quickly. And so one of the, the things you can use to measure if it's dry or not, because for instance, drywall, you could have some kind of water damage or water intrusion event or flood. Um, and the drywall appears dry to the touch, but maybe inside it's not completely dry yet. You can use a moisture meter, um, and the moisture meter works by sending an electric current or something to that effect and measuring that so it can sense if there's wetness deeper deeper down into whatever you're measuring, the wood or the drywall. And are these um, tools available to, I mean, can you get one at Home Depot or Lowe's? Or? I think you can. Okay. You can. The ones that we use are typically uh, uh, a little higher quality. Because you don't want to put up more drywall if your wood is if it's, you wet. Know, it's wet. Yeah, you want to you want to make sure things are dried out, um, and this is one way one way to do that. Okay. Um, moisture reading should be less than seventeen percent. I think that's more for 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 wood. Um, I, I don't know. It's been a long time since I've done any moisture surveys. Every 
every moisture meter I think works differently and will come with directions or manufacturer specifications and instructions on their particular meter. And I know there's different settings, whether you're measuring drywall or wood that you move the setting. So then it um, measures for that particular material. And then it will tell you based on the percentage, if it's wet, kind of medium wet or dry. And, and yes, just like chemical exposure or really any other type of exposure, the more you have, the higher your potential for exposure or harmful exposure. So if you've got a, your whole wall is nothing but mold colonies, then it's, it has more mold spores that are going to get into the air. And so you have the potential to uh, inhale more mold spores, whereas you just have a corner in the basement that's wet with a little bit of mold growing on it, then it's going to be much less, less harmful, less how long, exposure. How long would that little colony take to, to be established? I mean, how I mean, it could be literally overnight. I I have seen in one instance, and this wasn't flood, it wasn't disaster, it was just wet condensate on a on a um, HVAC system, um, and the and the it, the climate was just right. It was very warm. It was humid. They had the food source there on the HVAC material, and um, literally overnight, it was just it went from no visible mold. To the whole thing was covered about 50 square feet, 50 to 75 square feet. So if there's anybody out there that walks into a building and sees that, what do you, what is the first thing they need to do? Just, hey, this isn't right. They need if, to leave or they need to say, hey, I need to get the proper gear. Well, you would need, if you would probably not want to spend a lot of time in there if you didn't absolutely have to. And if you have to, for whatever reason, um, if you're doing the survey or the assessment, um, then certainly protect yourself with the Tyvek suit or long sleeves, gloves. Know that if you get it on your clothing that you're going to be taking it with you out the door when you go. Um, and then the respirator, the dust mask, the N95 dust mask, so you don't breathe in the spores. And there's nothing you should treat it before you start removing it or just – Get it out there as soon as possible because then you're... Well, if you're going to be removing it, now there's, this isn't a mold course, but, you know, if, if you're a homeowner, for instance, and you're going to remove stuff, then um, you want to encapsulate it, maybe put a, and I can't, I can't train people how to do that, right? But I can tell you that you probably want to cover it or encapsulate it some, some way. When I say cover it, maybe cover it with plastic, um, so you don't spread it around, and as you're removing it and manipulating it, you don't get the spores um, airborne. Okay. Um, again, back to personal protective equipment. Um, you want to be sure you know, if you're going to use a respirator, for instance, when I say respirator, I mean dust mask um, for, for this type of work. If you're going to use the dust mask or if you're a worker and you have a half face respirator, which is what's shown in the picture, you want to be sure you've been properly trained to wear it, you know how to wear it properly, um, and that you're medically fit to wear it as well. So this is a kind of a montage or a collage of PPE that would be good for this type of response. You've got some gloves there. They look to be like a heavier duty nitrile glove that would offer you some puncture, maybe not puncture protection, but resistance to punctures and scratches. Um, in addition to chemical protection, you've got the uh, half face cartridge there on the lower right um, with the pink with the pink cartridge or filters, that's for dust and would protect you from mold spores. Coveralls to pick, protect your clothing from picking up stuff and taking it out with you. Um, goggles for your eyes and then work boots. Safety glasses, if you're going to be um, maybe doing more debris removal, you want to consider more the goggles than just safety glasses so you protect uh, things from falling inside the glasses. I know if you're looking up a lot and doing things um, over your head uh, and people beside you doing work, there's that potential for things to get underneath, to fly underneath or over 
your glasses, so goggles might be a good choice. Uh, respirators, we already talked about a lot, but that top picture is your typical, what people think of as more of a dust mask, is that, and that is an N, that particular picture is an N95 disposable dust respirator. And then you've got the half face with the pink filters, which are the P100 filters, or a full face um, respirator, which for typical hurricane flood response wouldn't be needed, but if you've got some chemical thing going on, um, it might be necessary. If you are wearing a respirator or a dust mask and you are a worker doing that as part of your job, then the OSHA rules for respiratory protection need to be followed as well. And that, that includes, and I already mentioned this, fit testing to make sure medically fit to wear the respirator training so that you know how to wear it properly and um, some other things. Um, there's some seal checks you can do to make sure you've got the respirator, and this is part of respirator training, so I won't cover it too much, but there's a couple different types of things you can do to check to make sure your respirator is sealed properly, and that's referenced, uh, referred to as seal checks. Another type of, you can inhale and do a seal check or a positive pressure seal check by blocking the exhalation valve and, and kind of gently blowing out negative pressure seal check by, by inhaling a little bit and see if there's any leaks around your nose piece or around your, your jawline maybe. If there's leaks, then you know you're not, you, you don't have it on properly or it doesn't fit. Um, if you are wearing respirators um, and it's a non-disposable type, you want to clean them with a non-alcohol wipe, store them properly so they don't get all messed up and dirty when they're not on. Um, other protective measures, and I think this is just a repeat of, of one of the first um, slides we had, proper PPE, earplugs, bottled water, um, rain gear, sunscreen, kind of a packing list. Mm, another packing list, kind of PPE or equipment list. If you are a worker, again, or a company that's sending workers out, you might check these uh, different things listed here to see if that's what you need to put in your work bag to take out with you. And that is it. Um, summary, there's those uh, links, again, training and resources. And, and as I said, I checked a lot of different um, sources for information when I put this together. And by far the most valuable that I found is diet. N-I-E-H-S website. The second link here is to a number of podcasts, too, that I thought was very informative. Um, and there are a variety of topics, including disaster recovery and mold. Okay. Well, thanks, Lori. That's a lot of great information. And we just thought it was really important to, to get it out because there's going to be a lot of people that are headed down there to help uh, family, loved ones, their companies. I know that there's a lot of companies that are sending people from Dallas and other surrounding areas to these affected areas. And so it's not something that we talk about every day. And so I think it's great. So I'm going to open it up and see if there's any questions from our audience. If you guys have any questions specifically that you're dealing with, uh, go ahead and type them into your, uh, your question tab. And Lori, is there anything that you've learned um, safety wise over the last couple of weeks, like anything that's, you know, Hey, I, that's really more important. That that's something that came up that is new. You can say, no, I just, I'm just no, trying to fill up the questions. No, not really. Nothing, nothing new. I mean, it's all really standard stuff. If you're in the world of safety to start with and then all of this is like, well, yeah, but I think the main thing is we, we say wear PPE and wear your dust mask and, and do this and do that. And, now I'm not down there and I'm not affected, but I know people that are and and that's things that they really can't do mm -hmm. because they don't have, you know, they can't find PPE. So they're really uh, hurting down there for for people to donate that stuff or send it down there somehow. Okay. Well, we don't have any questions coming up, so we'll just leave it there. If you guys have any questions. Uh, you can email them to me at lfrench at wh-n.com, and I'll make sure that Lori sees it. But thank you guys for joining us. Thank you, Lori, for spending uh, an hour with us here. And um, 
thank you for all the great information. Okay, thanks. All right, have a great, great weekend. It's Friday. Have a great weekend.